Hi everybody, this is Kent, and this is the post and beam greenhouse we built in the garden. And in this series of videos, I'm going to go through step by step how we put this together. In the last episode of this series, we excavated the site, installed underground drainage, built forms, and poured the concrete foundation for the greenhouse. In this episode, we'll prep the posts and set them in the brackets then cut, notch, and assemble the beams and place them on the posts. Then add the corner braces and get the ridge beam set in temporary supports. I'll start by cutting the four 6x6 corner posts to length. With a large speed square, I mark a pencil line around the 6x6. If all is well, and it's a good straight 6x6, then the last line will meet up with the first. Using the speed square as a guide, I now make a cut on each side. The depth of cut for my circular saw is less than half the post thickness, so I'll need to finish the cut with a handsaw. The post brackets are made for a 5.5 inch square post, available at most lumber yards. Mine were milled to a full 6 inches, so I'll need to trim the bottom ends to fit these brackets. I'll mark the depth of the bracket on the bottom of the post, and I'll double check the width and also mark that. I'll unplug my circular saw, then with the help of a combination square, I'll set the depth of cut I need. And they were all around a half inch. I make my first cut along the very end, then check with the square to see if my depth of cut is correct. Now I'll make a series of cuts up to the line. And this post was sliding around, so I needed to pause here and add a clamp to the sawhorse to act as a stop. I'll break off these wafers, then clean it up with a chisel. With that done, I'll spin the post around and cut it to its final length. Again, marking around the 6x6, six six, then making four cuts with a circular saw, and then finishing it with a handsaw. And I'll take that post and test it in the bracket. Looks good, so I'll move on to chamfering the edges with a power plane. And then I'll chamfer the ends with a sanding disc on my angle grinder. And I'll repeat these steps for the other three corner posts. When done, I'll roll on a few coats of stain. This is a Seco brand stain. It's the SRDRE and the color is butternut. I get asked a lot about this stain, so I'll put a link in the description. For most of this project, I'll be using Western Red Cedar, but I was short a few 6x6s, so I needed to substitute with some noble fir that I had. It's not as weather resistant as a cedar, so I'll be applying more coats of this stain for additional protection. With the stain dry, I can install the corner posts. I'll stand them in their brackets and drive in one screw for now. I have stakes driven in the ground with temporary braces attached to hold each post as I install them. I add clamps here while I'm using a level to plumb the post vertical. I run in a screw through each brace into the post as I need the bar clamps for the next one. And I ran in more of the galvanized structural screws through the saddles and into the bottom of each post as I moved along. And I was checking the measurement from one post to the next here, outside face to outside face, before driving in the screws. Not only is it satisfying to get these posts up, they are now out of my way. Even with a small project like this, I was quickly running out of sawhorse space for all the timbers. For the long beams that run north to south, I have to make them from two 6x6s, as I didn't have any milled that were long enough for this greenhouse. I'll start by cutting a square end in this cedar 6x6, just like I did with the posts. Then I'll lay out and mark the scarf joint on the same end. Or this could be called a lap joint if you like. After making the shoulder cut, I realized that this face of the 6x6 was not flat, so I ran my circular saw along the edge. 
and a bit of chisel work cleaned that up and gave me a flat face to work from. I think now that a hand plane would have worked just as well here. I'm not a timber framer, so it took a while to find the best way for me to make these cuts for these joints. I found that as long as I had a flat face, and the opposite face was also flat and parallel to the first, I could make a cut on each side with the circular saw. Then I could join these cuts with a handsaw. For this project, I decided to join these beam segments using three bolts at the scarf joint. To countersink the head and the washer of the bolt, I first drilled a shallow hole with a Forstner bit. Then with a drill guide to keep the hole square to the face, I can drill all the way through for the shank of the bolt. Everything here looked good, so I can rotate that beam and mate the other one to it. And I wasn't going to move on to any other cuts on these beam sections until they were permanently joined into one. The two sections I was working with were long enough that I could redo this joint if I messed it up. Then I clamped the two beam sections together to drill through the other piece. And I needed a longer bit for this. Those pipe clamps, along with the one by one cleats, pulled the joint tightly together for this drilling operation. I'll add some construction adhesive to the joint before I put it back together. Now construction adhesive is not really traditional, but I kind of like it, so I'm going to use it. And then I can tap in the bolts and tighten the nuts. And I reinstalled all the clamps I was using here to pull the joint together. And this ended up working well. And I think it's probably stronger than it needs to be given the load it will eventually carry. But it will hold up well during handling and assembly. And there is a stud wall under it as well. I can now trace the quarter ellipse profile from my plywood pattern onto the end of the beam. And I like to mark this on both sides so I can check my cut afterwards. With a handsaw, I'll cut a shallow groove where the blade of the jigsaw will enter and exit the wood. This will help the long blade at least start vertically, or square to the face. <laughs> well, that clamp clearly wasn't tight enough. And the blade followed the line pretty well. There was some push-off as the curve radius tightened, and I ran into a knot. But I can clean that up by making a cut along the line on the other side. Then I can dress it with a sanding disc on my angle grinder. A portable bandsaw would be the best option for this type of cut, but I get acceptable results with this long blade on a powerful jigsaw, as you can see at the beginning of this next shot. These beams sit down on the posts an inch, so I'll cut that relief into them now. I set the depth of my circular saw to an inch and make the series of wafer cuts, then break those off and clean it up with a chisel. There's another deeper groove, or dado if you like, in the side of these beams to accept the east-west tie beams, and I'll cut that in the same manner as the previous one. I need to also countersink and drill two holes for lag bolts here. The first will come down from the top and into the post. The other will run horizontally through the beam and into the end of the east-west tie beams. And these holes are offset so the bolts won't run into each other. The drill guide ensures I start the hole for the lag bolt shank square to the face of the beam. Now with the north-south beams cut and chamfered, I'll test fit them before staining. And Calvin, my neighbor, came by to help me with this. And the first one looked good. And the second one dropped into place as well. A few checks with a tape and a level, then we pulled them down again. To finish the front tie beam, I'll cut dados for the doorway 4x4s. The front and rear tie beams also have a lap cut in each end to sit partially down on the posts. 
I assembled the east and west stud walls from 2x4 cedar. Marilyn helped me set these in place over the anchor bolts. This was easier to do now before the beams went up. Putting together these videos can be tedious and time consuming. I hope you enjoy the effort that goes into them and that you find them educational or at least somewhat entertaining. And if so, I only ask one thing of you, that you give it a like so YouTube will share it around and offer it as a suggestion to other viewers. I would really appreciate that and I also really like reading any suggestions or comments you have. I try to answer as many questions as possible. I marked the location of the anchor bolts on the sill plate the same way I did on the shed extension I built last year, clamping some boards to the foundation as stops, then setting the sill plate over the bolts, then tapping with a mallet to make an indent in the plate. Then I can drill holes at these marks. I added a 1x2 angled temporary brace to these wall sections to keep them square and to make them easier to carry and position. A double top plate for these walls is not necessary, as I will be screwing it to the beam above, and this stud wall is sharing the load of the rafters with the beam. Calvin came back to help me install the finished beams over these stud walls. Now we set the front tie beam in place for a test fit. I needed to trim the length a bit so we pulled it down again. I left the laps a bit long when I cut these ties just in case. With a long bit I'll drill down into the posts and run in the galvanized lag bolts. Some penetrating oil helped here. I think there's a fair amount of redundancy in this connection. There's this long lag bolt, and I would think for the size of the structure it would be enough to secure the beam to the post, but there's also the GRK structural screws securing the wall sections to the posts and beams, and later I'll add some corner braces between this beam and each corner post. I'm not an engineer, but I think with all of this the strength of this connection is more than adequate. Now the back stud wall can be dropped into place. I had these cedar studs, top plates and sill plates also milled from trees on our property and they were cut a full two inches thick. And I set my anchor bolts for a one and a half inch sill plate when we poured the foundation. So I had just enough of the bolt sticking up for a washer and a nut, but just enough. Also, I set these bolts in the center of the 5 inch thick foundation wall, but I have my sill plate flush with the inside of the foundation, so my anchor bolts are not centered in the sill plate. It's a mistake for sure, but I can live with it. This rear tie beam had a bit more crown to it than I would have liked. I was able to straighten that a bit with extra washer head screws run up through the top plate of the rear stud wall. I also added some small angle brackets to keep my frame wall together under this additional stress. If I was going to do this again, I would have rotated this beam 90 degrees and oriented the bow toward the rear of the greenhouse, so essentially eliminating this crown. To tie the beams together, I'll drill and run in horizontal lag bolts. I have four corner braces ready to attach to the post and north-south beams. These are flush mounted, drilled and held in place with lag bolts. These bolts are angled in toward the post and beam joint. I've added these same curved braces to other structures I've built and I've covered them in other videos so I won't go into that detail here. I'll put a link to that video that shows them being made in the upper right and in the description below. That video covers the pattern making and all the steps and tools I used. Here's the first of the two 4x4s that make up the doorway. They are full dimension so I did need to trim the ends to fit the post saddles. They were also chamfered with a power plane and stained first. Structural galvanized screws are run in through the saddles and then I toe screwed the tops into the tie beam above. 
The orientation of the saddle brackets and the dado cuts in the tie beam gave me enough play to plumb these 4x4s side to side and front to back. Then the front stud walls can be angled in and screwed to the posts and beams. The ridge beam is also made in two pieces, and I'll cut a scarf joint in the 2x8s with a circular saw. And after a test fit of my lap cuts, I'll apply some construction adhesive, then clamp the joint together. I have two angle brackets that I'll then clamp and screw across the upper and lower join. I'll add a hardware list to the plan I have available for download from my website. I also added a single mending plate on one side. Then flip the ridge beam over and added two on the other side. Like the beams, this may be a bit of overkill for this joint, but it will have to tolerate some rough handling when it gets lifted into place before the rafters go up. I bang together some temporary supports that I'll screw to the top of the tie beams. These supports have a slot to center the ridge beam and also to allow me to fine tune its height. There's a 2x6 I added that connects the long beams, and I ran additional braces from the temporary ridge beam supports to this 2x6. This stiffened the temporary supports so my ridge beam would not move side to side or front to back. Now we can lift and slide the ridge beam into place. It was a bit tricky, but it went well. Now it looks like we're getting somewhere. Coming right up in the next episodes, we'll start working on the rafters, the polycarbonate glazing, and the door and vents. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.